Charles is truly, truly an individual. And I feel like over the course of a lifetime, you don't meet all that many mm. true, true, true individuals. And Charles is certainly, he's fluent in at least five languages that I know of. Um, he has uh, family connections, ancestral connections across both continents, uh, including as he has pointed out, New Hampshire. And we would all, having grown up in ports of myself, surrounded by history, captivated by uh, New Hampshire history in particular, we, we would inevitably um, talk, about, talk about New Hampshire history quite a bit. And over and over, when we'd have our discussions, he would have a unique and different take uh, on, on New Hampshire history, New England history. And in most cases, it was far more interesting than my own take or the take that I had been carrying around with me. So I thought he'd be, I thought he'd be a terrific uh, guest for us. Uh, he's an author of over a dozen books, my favorite being a narrative history of rum, drink rum. Um, uh, today he's going to talk, he's going to focus on, on colonial history as seen through the lens of the loyalist cause, specifically New Hampshire, his latest being Puritan's Empire, which is, I believe, on its way to the Athenaeum now, if it's not there already. So if you would, please join me in welcoming Charles Colom from Chumau, Austria. Uh, thanks very, very much uh, for that introduction, Jake. I'll do my best to live up to it. Uh, and thank you very much for having me. I've got a great deal of respect for the Portsmouth Athenaeum. Um, having seen its exterior on several occasions, I've never been inside yet, but who knows, it may happen. Uh, tonight's uh, topic is indeed the Loyalists um, in New Hampshire. But of course, to understand the Loyalists in New Hampshire during the Revolution, we've got to look at what Loyalism was in the 13 colonies as a whole first and see what, what the New Hampshire model had in common with the rest and how it was different. And it certainly was very unique in a number of ways because New Hampshire was a very unique uh, member of the 13 colonies for a number of reasons. Uh, it was... Um, in a sense, ironic in the sense that New Hampshire's roots were quite, were at once old and shallow. And what I mean by that is that the first settlement, of course, in New Hampshire goes to the 17th century, but it was clustered along the coast. And Portsmouth, where you are, really was it for a long, long time. Um, to understand how the revolution went in New Hampshire in the course of it, there's one name you have to be familiar with, and that is Wentworth. To this day, a name to conjure with on the New Hampshire coast. But for our purposes, uh, it's important to remember that even after the revolution to a degree, but certainly for the 50 years preceding, the Wentworth family were it. They were as much New Hampshire as Portsmouth was New Hampshire. And we'll return to New Hampshire in a moment. But first, we'll look at the 13 colonies as a whole to understand where the Loyalists came from. Now, I have to say that the version we get in school, or at least we got in school long ago, today, of course, it's, the revolution is taught very differently uh, to the degree that it's taught at all. But uh, the common idea was that there had been a revolt for freedom against the evil British who, of course, were oppressed in the colonies. And as we know, Paul Revere made his famous ride. Uh, we had the, uh, we had the uh, unfortunate uh, event with Benedict Arnold and Major Andre. Then there was Yorktown, freedom was achieved, and the present state of perfection that we have begun. Well, slight oversimplification, to say the least. Even John Adams, who was not what you would call a great proponent of the Loyalist cause, <laughs> maintained that if he, well, you wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't, but uh, he maintained that a third of the population of the uh, colonies was Loyalist, a third was rebel, and a third was neutral, which effectively means that two thirds were not in favor of independence. 
Well, that takes away the whole issue of democracy straight away. Now, I've been an historian most of my adult life. And I'm going to say something that's going to sound horrific to um, people of our time and training. But I'll say it anyway. History is accomplished by determined minorities. Change is never democratic. Now, that's quite a part of whether it's good change or bad change. The vast majority of people at any moment would rather be left alone. Please don't beat me. Please don't stop me. Please don't take my stuff. I don't like that. I'd like you to leave me alone, please. Is all the majority of people at any given moment ask from their masters. It's what our ancestors asked. It's what we ask. It's what our descendants will ask. Well, unfortunately or otherwise, because change isn't always bad and it's not always good, from time to time, the majority do not get their deepest wish. They get pushed or prodded in one direction or another. And in that sense, the American Revolution was no different from any other occurrence in history. I like to call it our, our first civil war, because it was. Uh, we've we've uh, learned from Longfellow to think of Revere shouting, the British are coming, the British are coming. It's not what he said. He said, the regulars are out which meant regulars as opposed to militia, i.e. the Minutemen. It's important to bear this in mind because what occurred during the American Revolution was at once a civil war, once a change of government, but certainly at the beginning it was seen as an internal family quarrel. The other thing I should mention, uh, because it, will, uh, it certainly affects my own biases, and I uh, believe that the honest historian lets you know what his biases are so you can judge for yourself and accommodate them to your own biases. <laughs> uh, and that is that my name, Coulomb, is French Canadian. Now, this makes sense because my father's family came from Quebec. True enough. But remember that my ancestors were beneficiaries of the Quebec Act, which down here was one of the um, intolerable acts and is denounced in what I can only call Orwellian terms in the Declaration of Independence. Now, I have to say that because already you know I've got a bias. So I put it out there. Now, let's move along. I don't, uh, I don't really want to get into the um, causes of the revolution so much, simply because I want to focus on one aspect that we don't generally look at. And I know you all know about the Stamp Act and the build up to the war and so on and so forth. So we'll, we'll leave that alone. What we will look at, however, is who the loyalists were in general in the 13 colonies. From the province of Maine, the district of Maine, I should say, all the way down to Georgia. There are several things we could say about them. Contrary to what uh, we would have heard when we were children in school, they were not generally the wealthy, quite the contrary. There were some people, and you see this in particular in New Hampshire, but there were some people who were office holders under the crown or had served in the militia during the French War or whatever. They had taken oaths that they did not feel they could break. But the rank and file of the loyalists, not the leadership, are the people who I find interesting. They tended to be members of cultural and religious minorities. Now, remember, every colony was different. Every colony had a, a very intricate setup all its own. So when I say that the one thing they would have in common is that they tended to belong to cultural and religious minorities, you'll get things like the following. In uh, uh, the southern states, where the Church of England was the established faith, Georgia up to Maryland, uh, Anglicans tended to be rebels. The Presbyterians, who were the merchants, as opposed to the Anglican planners and all that, they tended to be loyalists. But in New England, not least of all New Hampshire, uh, Anglicans tended to be loyalists, and Congregationalists tended to be rebels. Of course, the Congregation was the state church in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. Now, notice I'm saying tended. I'm doing that on purpose because the truth is, as with any civil war, you'll find exceptions all the way around. Everything I'm going to say, there are exceptions. So that's just the nature of civil war. All right. 
So uh, in New York, for instance, the more assimilated people of Dutch descent were, the likelier they were to support the rebellion. The less assimilated, the more they had retained their Dutch customs and language, the likelier they were to be loyalists. Um, and you, uh, you see the same pattern over and over again. It's the one thing you can say uh, that's a continual reality because the differences in each colony were so great. The second thing, uh, the second creator of loyalists, if you will, was geographical. Areas that were sort of neglected, left out of the mainstream, not really paid attention to, their denizens had usually tended to be loyalist. And areas, and this is where New Hampshire, incidentally, was kind of an exception. Areas that were more metropolitan, more at the center of things, tended to be rebel. Now, having said that, I'm going to point out an interesting factoid. The areas that tended to be loyalist during the revolution geographically, during the second civil war in 1860, if they were in the north, they tended to be copperhead. But if they were in the south, they tended to be unionist. Now, what does that tell us? What it appears to tell me anyway, is that in all three cases, First Civil War in general, the, uh, the Second Civil War in the North, Second Civil War in the South, it was a question of those people who were already pretty much in charge telling folk whom they had neglected or annoyed, uh, areas they'd neglected or annoyed, join us in our glorious crusade. Uh, to which the response was somewhat suboptimal. No, I don't think I want to do that. Thanks for asking, but uh, no, no. Well, you must join us in fighting the king. Well, see, the problem is that up until now, since you dominate the assembly, the royal governor and the king has been the only access to anything beyond you. I've, I, no, I don't think I'm doing that. And so too, four score and 20 years later. In the north, Areas that were a little out of it, a little neglected, tended to be copperhead. In the South, they tended to be unionist. In both cases, they told the folk who offered them another glorious crusade, I'd rather not. That is also true for New Hampshire. Because if you look at Southern sympathies in New Hampshire in the Second Civil War, they weirdly are foreshadowed by the way loyalism worked out in the first one. You get bonus points, by the way, if you can name the two most famous copperheads to New Hampshire. Any takers? Well, I'll give you a hint. One had been president of the United States. No, not Lyndon Johnson. Yes, Frank, your very own Franklin Pierce. He actually had... Uh, Secret Service watching him, the equivalent of Secret Service, but not for his protection. The other uh, who's very famous was, uh, well, he's not famous, but he, who is famous is his son, who is New Hampshire's most famous poet, Robert Frost. Do we remember Robert Frost's middle name? Lee. Robert Lee Frost. And that's why Robert Frost was born in San Francisco and not in his father's home state of New Hampshire. Now, why do I say that it was weirdly foreshadowed by the loyalists? We'll get there. Don't you, don't you fret. So we have the, we have the uh, um, division culturally, religiously, geographically. Uh, Again, just looking now at the uh, Catholic community in the colonies, which for the most part was only to be found in uh, four colonies, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and uh, upstate New York in the uh, Mohawk Valley. What we find is a parallel of all the others. The wealthier the Catholics tended to be, the more connected with the power structure, the likelier they were to be rebels. The less, the likelier they were to be loyalists. So the Carroll family were rebels, and the Clifton family were not. They were loyalists. One of their number being the uh, 
commander of the Roman Catholic Volunteers, raised in Baltimore. The, uh, the Catholics out in the Mohawk Valley were all Scots Highlanders who had been settled by the famous Sir William Johnson and uh, were driven out one night in 1776 and made the winter trek to Montreal. What's interesting, though, is that they did their little bit for history because their parish priest was an Irishman named Father John McKenna. Uh, what an Irishman thought about being stuck with all those Scotsmen in peacetime, I don't know. But in wartime, <laughs> I don't know. I wasn't there, despite my age. But in wartime, he uh, joined his, uh, uh, his former parishioners when they were formed into the Royal Highland Emigrants as a loyalist unit that came back to pay visits to their former neighbors. And he went along as their chaplain, being the first Catholic chaplain in the British Army since the overthrow of James II. So that's a little bit of uh, British revolutionary military trivia you can save and give out at Christmas time. All right. So all of that pattern brings us back to the glorious and God-protected state of New Hampshire. Now, as I said earlier, New Hampshire was unusual amongst the uh, colonies. Most of its development had actually taken place in the 20 or 30 years prior to the revolution under the Wentworths. Where you're sitting right now in Portsmouth, as you know, there's a little town close by called Newcastle. Newcastle has two important places for our story. One is the Wentworth home, which was the, uh, the mansion of Benning, Governor Benning Wentworth, who basically built the Wentworth machine that ran the province. And also there is the many times remodeled, torn down, rebuilt fort that today is called Fort Constitution, but was Fort William and Mary at the time of our story. Uh, and it was the only non-frontier post in New Hampshire. So, during the, uh, during the reign of Governor Wentworth, Governor Benning Wentworth, New Hampshire was pretty much, pretty much tied to the coast. But Benning Wentworth began granting townships out in the exterior, in the uh, uh, interior, uh, even so far as the other side of the Connecticut River. Now, of course, there was some difference of opinion as to where New Hampshire's boundaries lay in terms of its uh, boundary with New York. As far as New York was concerned, it was the Connecticut River. As far as New Hampshire was concerned, it was Lake Champlain. So the area in between, which we call today Vermont, was then, as I'm sure you know, called the Hampshire Grants. This, in turn, would lead, at the time of the Revolution, to a weird civil war all its own. Prior to the revolution, owners of New York land grants and owners of New Hampshire land grants fought a kind of guerrilla war against each other. And the irony is that the adherents of the New Hampshire folk, they, uh, they ended up becoming the Green Mountain Boys under Ethan Allen. Whereas the adherents of New York, the, Yorker, the uh, Yorkers, they tended to be loyalist. And you may or may not have heard of a town in Vermont called Arlington. It's one of the oldest towns in Vermont, but it was settled by Anglicans and during the revolution was called Tory Hollow. And to this day, they, they remember that. One of the uh, things I did in preparation for writing my American history, Puritan's Empire, was to read an awful lot of local histories from Maine down to Georgia. And this is where the patterns I, I spoke of earlier became obvious to me. I mentioned it because in the case of uh, uh, New Hampshire, those who remained loyal to the crown tended to come geographically in two areas. One was Portsmouth, which was filled with loyalists. That's one reason why Portsmouth is not the capital of New Hampshire now. The other area was the frontier. After Benning Wentworth retired, he was replaced by his nephew, Sir John Wentworth. Sir John was really responsible for opening up the interior of New Hampshire. 
He was the one responsible, for instance, for introducing the county system. Five counties, the five initial counties. Why was this? Well, they had had all these towns established, but there was virtually no uh, law enforcement. There was one sheriff for all New Hampshire. So he was able to bring in county governments and thus uh, thus avoid what uh, New Hampshire appeared to be on a collision course with, which was the kind of problem that agitated the Carolinas and the regulator wars before the, uh, before the revolution. Um, one of the problems you had during the settling of the frontier, of course, was that people were going further and further out and leaving behind the machinery of government. So if they wanted to register land, they wanted to get anything accomplished, they'd have to travel miles and miles and miles to the nearest county courthouse. Well, they had the same problem in New Hampshire, but they didn't go through the same unpleasantries because of Wentworth's timely move. He uh, authorized roads into the interior of the province. Uh, he invested in uh, land at Lake Winnipesaukee and was responsible for making that uh, garden spot more accessible and more interesting to people on the coast. So as a result of that, a number of Wentworth's personal supporters were to be found out in the interior of New Hampshire. So again, you've got Portsmouth and you've got the New Hampshire frontier. And those were the two great centers of loyalist feeling in New Hampshire. Now, has anyone seen the Wentworth old age home in Portsmouth? I'm sure they've got some other name for it, but you know the place I mean. You, uh, you may be aware that part of it is actually Wentworth's home. John Wentworth's home. That was where he lived. And that was where one night, well, I don't want to get ahead of my story. So he spent the years before the, uh, before the uh, revolution consolidating the province and consolidating the position of his own uh, clique, as you might say. Because the Wentworths had, were intermarried with all, four or five major families in the province. And between them, they had pretty much a monopoly on power. This was unique, I have to say, in the colonies. In most of the colonies, the cliques that dominated the assembly ran the show. They would, they would be the architects of the revolution, not in New Hampshire. And that was solely because of John Wentworth, who uh, you might say that he was the flip side of Governor Trumbull of Connecticut who was the only uh, royal governor to go to the rebel side. There was, and there wasn't much love lost between them. The reason being that as uh, surveyor of the King's Woods, uh, Sir John had kind of a, a lock on the timber trade with Britain. You've heard, I suppose, of the King's Broad Arrow. Well, all of your vast forests in New Hampshire, the, uh, those that would, uh, the, the trees that would be fit for masts for the Royal Navy were reserved to the King and marked with the king's broad arrow. So that built up the New Hampshire economy, but Wentworth wouldn't allow any of those logs to go down the Connecticut River and be shipped from uh, ports in Connecticut. So that really annoyed Trumbull and it annoyed the, the Connecticut folk of New Hampshire quite a bit. Anyhow, uh, that was all before the revolution. Now he was actually quite popular uh, almost until the end because he provided jobs for everybody. He, he, he knew what he was doing. But he got caught up in things larger than himself. Now, he negotiated the whole tea thing very, very carefully. There was no Portsmouth Tea Party. What happened was that the, uh, the merchants who uh, wanted the tea dumped were uh, conciliated, and the tea was shipped to Halifax. So they escaped the opprobrium that would occur for Boston. Uh, Wentworth was masterful at that kind of thing. But as time went on, and as the, the rebel side became pushier and pushier and pushier, and on the other hand, the ministry in London became more and more active, shall we say, in uh, response. One of them is that 
the events that would so deeply affect New Hampshire were very much beyond New Hampshire's grasp. Boston was the, the real center of influence in New England at the time. And when the, uh, when the um, uh, Boston Tea Party came, uh, and then following it, the uh, uh, Lexington conquered and all that, it was everything that Sir John could do to keep New Hampshire uninvolved. Where he came a cropper was when the British decided that they would uh, send troops to Boston and they needed housing built. Well, it made sense to Sir John, since he was the surveyor of the King's Woods, that he should send wood to Boston to be built into soldiers' uh, barracks. That precipitated a big problem with the um, pro-rebel side in New Hampshire. And they show, they seized on this as an example of his uh, hatred of freedom. Eventually, and this, you, you've got to bear in mind that the ranks of the rebel leadership in New Hampshire came from what I have to call the second tier of leadership. In other words, unlike the other colonies where they were generally the people that ran the assemblies, these were assemblymen who were somewhat on the outs with Wentworth. Uh, well, again, second stringers, if you like. But they organized the same sorts of mob action that, uh, that were organized in Massachusetts and elsewhere. And finally, uh, it was decided to seize the powder at Fort William and Mary in, in uh, Newcastle. Now, Wentworth was faced with a lot of problems. The militia was no longer reliable. And the garrison at Fort William and Mary was, you ready for the numbers, ladies and gentlemen? 5 Five soldiers and one commander to guard the uh, powder and shot at Fort William and Mary. They were overwhelmed one night in 1775. And shortly after that, Sir John and his family and various other people left Portsmouth for Boston and then for Halifax and then London. And this is where the story of Loyalist New Hampshire becomes a bit fragmentary because unlike the other colonies where there were centers of British, um, British force, British arms, Boston and Massachusetts until the evacuation, New York after it was taken, Philadelphia after it was taken, Charleston, Savannah, etc. New Hampshire didn't have anything like that at all. And with the departure of Sir John and uh, most of his allies, there was no real leadership for the loyalists in New Hampshire. So what did they do? Well, there were three possibilities. They could take up arms as loyalists did in the other 12 colonies. And there were, in fact, a couple of regiments of New Hampshire loyalists, none of them serving in New Hampshire. They all had to leave. So if you wanted to serve in the king's arms um, and you were a New Hampshire man, well, you'd have to go to initially to Boston and then you'd have to go to New York. So that was it. And there were, as you know, except for a few uh, raids and so forth, there was no, no pitched battles in New Hampshire. Closest uh, that, ever it came, that the war came was Bennington. So what did that leave? Two things. Counterfeiting. And loyalists went in in a big way for counterfeiting in New Hampshire. The second was espionage, spying. Having said that, uh, there were very few, because of this, there are very few uh, New Hampshire loyalists, other than Sir John and, and those people, that are really terribly well known today. But there is one. One very important character. His name was Benjamin Thompson. And uh, over here, we know him better as de Graaf Rumfort. We know him here as the great scientist. But of course, he, um, he was a loyalist. He didn't change his views. And so he had to leave and lost everything. 
But New Hampshire's loss was the world's game, and certainly Bavaria's game. <laughs> so um, the the usual uh, the usual things were employed against the loyalists in New Hampshire, and here I've got to make a point. To really understand how things were, we've got to sort of put ourselves in that mindset. Now, imagine, if you will, that you've got a government you live under. I know it's hard because, you know, we don't have a very intrusive government, but pretend you did. You know, that you had you paid regular taxes to it, you interacted with it, you voted, that kind of thing. And then a group of your neighbors decide that they're going to start a government of their own in the name of freedom. Oh, and by the way, if you don't swear allegiance to it, well, bad things will happen to you. You know, we use the phrase tarring and feathering as kind of a joke. You know, why, if people find out how I feel, I'd be tarred and feathered. <laughs> yeah, well, tarring and feathering was not a joke. It was not fun at all. Stop and think what it meant. You get covered with hot tar. And you know what that stuff is like. You smelt it on the highway. Imagine being dunked with it. Then you got the feathers put on you. Then you get ridden out of town on a rail. Now, this is another expression we use. But it was literal. Now, I'm sure it would not be comfortable for a lady. But for a gentleman, it would have been sheer torture being ridden out of town <laughs> on a rail. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, not much fun, especially when you're covered in hot tar and feathers. And by the way, when you finally get to safety, presuming you survive the unpleasantness, because also you're naked. And uh, if it's a place like New Hampshire or Massachusetts and it's the wintertime, the, 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 the heat of the tar will not keep you warm very long. <laughs> uh, you got to get the tar off. Any idea how unpleasant that was? And it's in your hair, too, don't forget. This was not fun stuff, but you were lucky if you got tarred and feathered because you might be hanged for refusing to swear allegiance to a government that had not existed a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. Oh. I mean, we tend to forget what it was like. It wasn't pleasant. It wasn't fun at all. And you're stuck with a problem. Now, let's say you're a gentleman of conscience. Let's say you served in the army. You swore allegiance to the king. How far can you go along with this new government and keep your own personal integrity? Not easy. Not easy at all. And remember, if you don't, you're going to lose everything. They'll take your property. They'll take your house. Uh, and if you've got a wife and kids... <laughs> Again, not nearly so much fun or so easy as it seems. So, having said all of that, um, in common with loyalists throughout the colonies, this was something that faced New Hampshire loyalists. And mind you, it wasn't a simple thing like um, swear allegiance to the, uh, to the new government and you're, and you're fine, we won't bother you again. No. If you had the reputation of a loyalist, you'd be, kept, you'd be constantly checked on. You'd be asked to renew your, uh, your vows from time to time. Anything suspicious, you'd be asked about. Your mail would be read. What if you got a letter from a, a cousin in England or in New York? We know what they're like in New York. This, this was what they faced. But eventually the war ended. Now, 100,000 or so loyalists left the 13 colonies. That was a big chunk of the population. Three whole classes, at least, of Harvard men left. Of course, some might say that was a blessing. But, um, well, I mean, my grandfather taught at Harvard, so I can't be too nasty about it. I've got to pretend to be kind. But this was a, a tremendous loss. Where do they go? Well, they went to three three places primarily, uh, to Canada, where they went to Ontario, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and the eastern townships of Quebec. The Loyalists were really the founders of Anglo-Canada. They went to the Bahamas, 
with their, their descendants uh, having settled what are called the Abaco and the Lutheran Keys, then settled the Florida Keys, thinking that they were more Bahamas. They were wrong. A, a misapprehension the United States Navy helped them with. But if you ever get to Key West today, you'll be amazed at how much of their loyalist ancestry is remembered by the original inhabitants, the conks. I, I, was, I was quite amazed myself years ago to find that. Um, very proud of it. The third, and thus the third, uh, the fourth country after the United States, Anglo-Canada, the Bahamas, to owe its origin to our Second Civil War, Sierra Leone in Africa. The reason being that the king had granted freedom to any black who would join the king's armies. And a lot of them did. So uh, the last town in British hands was evacuated was New York. And an awful lot of uh, black loyalists, ex-slaves, runaway slaves, had concentrated there. General Washington uh, insisted that the, um, that the uh, black loyalists who had been slaves be left behind. General Carleton who had been governor of Quebec and would return to that role after the war. He was the last commander at New York. He um, smiled and said, we'll see what we can do about it. And he made sure that all the black slaves that were in the British Army were put on the first ships out to Nova Scotia. So he, I'm afraid he wasn't entirely honest with General Washington. But... The, uh, when the uh, black loyalists got to Nova Scotia, a number of them made a discovery. Nova Scotia is not as warm as Virginia. No, it's not. It's not. So uh, they petitioned the king for someplace nice and warm. And his response was, hmm, how about Africa? You could go back to the land of your ancestors. They thought it was a good idea, so they did. And as a result, the oldest Creole families in Sierra Leone are descendants of American black loyalists. Mm. And that is really the beginning of Sierra Leone's national life. So that was the fourth country that was created as a result of our first civil war. I might also add, just uh, to be complete and because I feel like it, uh, I do a lot of what I do, ladies and gentlemen, I do because I feel like doing. And this is one of those times. Um, the interrelatedness between American and European history can be gauged by three facts. The first is that the last battle of the what we used to call in my day the English Civil War, and what they call now much more both accurately and poetically, the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. Sounds like something out of Tolkien. Great stuff. The last battle of the Wars of the Three Kingdoms was fought not in any of the three kingdoms, but in Maryland, the Battle of the Seven. The second factor is that the Seven Years' War, which was, as we know, a, um, uh, a world war, really, because it was fought in Europe, it was fought in the Americas, it was fought on the high seas in Africa and Asia. It started not in some obscure place in Europe. It started in Jumanville Glen, Pennsylvania, where a, uh, a French officer named Jumonville and his command were tortured by and killed, some of them, if not all of them, by uh, British allied Shawnee Indians. The commander of the Shawnee was a young British militia officer named George Washington. So, uh, again, just as with the Declaration of Independence and the Quebec Act, the Quebec Act, Washington has a particular uh, position in the memory of my uh, father's people. The third, the last battle of the American Revolution was fought. Anybody want to tell me? It's probably not what you're thinking. I know it wasn't Seabrook, New Hampshire. No. Gibraltar. I'm sorry? Gibraltar. No. Good, good guess, but no, not Gibraltar. The siege of Gibraltar took place during the revolution. Good thought, but no. 
And it was brought to an end, by the way, because news came of the Treaty of Paris. It literally was the last war in the revolution. I won't keep you in suspense. It was the second siege of Cadalor in India. <laughs> that was the last battle of the revolution. <laughs> See, you got to bear something in mind, and that is that we think of the American Revolution, quite rightly, as both the war of our independence and as our first civil war. It had a third aspect. It was one of the several world wars of the Age of Sail. War of the Grand Alliance that we called uh, King William's War. The uh, War of Spanish Succession that we called Queen Anne's War. The War of Austrian Succession that we called King George's War. The Seven Years' War, French-Indian War. Our revolution and the various French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, all world wars. And the United States or the American colonies, depending on which, were involved in each one of them. So it, uh, I will end, uh, I will end uh, my narration and go to any questions you may have just by saying that um, the revolution turned out the way it did for two major reasons. And I, I will not try to prove my points, but rather leave them to you to uh, research on your own. The first was General Howe allowing Washington and his army to escape time after time in the Hudson Valley, for which, incidentally, he was brought up when he retired, came back to Britain, and took up his seat in Parliament as a Whig. Uh, he faced a parliamentary board of inquiry, and they said, you know, why did you do that? And his response was, the answer to that question is political, and I, does, I prefer not to give it. And their response was, okay, well, if you feel that way, I guess don't want to interfere with your conscience. The, uh, the second, um, and this is really what, what decided things, was the intervention of the French. Because you see, without the French fleet, the Royal Navy eventually would have, would have won, depending on you know, how long it might have taken. Um, but the intervention of the French and the Spanish and the Dutch uh, it made it impossible for Britain to win that war. So that was that. Having said all of that, I have come to the end of my narration, and I am open for questions, if any. Yes, ma'am. Eleanor. Yes, hi. I have a question about the former slaves who were brought from New York City to um, Nova Scotia. And then some of them ultimately went to or were brought to Sierra Leone. Um, wasn't it not just the climate issue, but that they encountered discrimination in Nova Scotia in terms of everything from the size of the land grants to um, just basic um, daily living? encountering prejudice and discrimination. And wasn't that a major reason that they went to Sierra Leone? It was, for, it was for those who left. But for those who stayed, obviously it wasn't. And you've got to remember a lot stayed. Right, but didn't they stay despite all these things? Wasn't this, you know, the lesser of two evils, basically? Not, not necessarily, because their experiences, uh, you've got to bear in mind that the settlement of Nova Scotia was done literally along regimental lines. Right. It wasn't just come on, come all. It wasn't like the Oklahoma deal. It was, so whomever you were next to made a big difference. The blacks who went to Sierra Leone did suffer what you say, uh, but you have to look at the units that they were put next to. They were usually from the South. Oh, I see. Now those that did not, um, and I'll go out on a bit of a limb here. Presumably, they found their neighbors much less difficult. Interestingly enough, uh, not only are there a great many descendants of the Black Loyalists in Nova Scotia today, but they went west to Ontario. Um, and I don't know if you're aware of this, but in the Canadian system, the Queen is, rep the, queen is the Queen of Canada, separately from being Queen of Great Britain. But she's represented in Ottawa on a Dominion level 
by the governor general and in each of the provinces by a lieutenant governor. Hmm. All right. Well, going back now 30 years, I met Ontario's first and so far only black lieutenant governor, Lincoln Alexander, who was a direct descendant of the lo of loyalists who came to Nova Scotia and then eventually went to Ontario. So let's just say that uh, hearing him tell his family's story was, you know, very good. And I asked him the same thing. Uh, had they no intention of going to Sierra Leone? And he looked at me. And before <laughs> I could say anything else, he said, have you ever been to Sierra Leone? <laughs> and I said, well, he said, exactly. <laughs> Just, I said, all right. All right. You, I never argue with anybody I call your honor. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, though, um, it, uh, their adventures in Sierra Leone were interesting, too, because uh, in 1792, uh, slavery, the slave trade was ended in the British Empire. And more than that, the Royal Navy started going after slave ships, which made it hard on New England shipping, I can tell you, because, you know, all, all of our slavers were New Englanders. Medford rum. But um, the, uh, the slaves in England were freed because they had slaves in England. And the vast majority of them opted to go to Sierra Leone. So Sierra Leone, and there they met the loyalists and, and mixed and matched, as I said. I told you the loyalists were the start of the Creole people. Well, these folk from England were yet another layer that came in. Sierra Leone was very much the uh, inspiration for our experiment with Liberia. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, there... They, it was a little wilder because the American Liberians, unlike the Creoles in Sierra Leone, they conquered all their neighbors, <laughs> you know, the neighboring tribes and all that. So that uh, that gave Liberia a sort of pathology of its own that was very different from Sierra Leone, even though they started out with the same idea. So history is a funny thing. It takes no prisoners and it doesn't let anyone be smug. Even the French Canadians have had failures. Hard to believe, I know. What? <laughs> no, I, my own people haven't always been perfect we've been somewhat less than optimal at times I can't think of any in particular but I'm sure they existed <laughs> All right. does that help yes thank you <laughs> alright uh, any more questions ladies and gentlemen what, uh, makes, you, what makes you think that um, Governor Wentworth's house was in Newcastle that was Benning Wentworth's. Uh, it was. Yeah, but it's, it, it's not in Newcastle. It's on Sagamore Road in Portsmouth. Ah, sorry. <laughs> you know, I have to tell you that lecturing on New Hampshire history, <laughs> the Portsmouth Athenaeum, you you really have to be either a fool or a glutton for punishment. <laughs> I don't like punishment, so I, I leave you to figure out what that what where that puts me, but. <laughs> I, I will say that uh, I will say that usually in, in all the guidebooks, they say it's Newcastle, but I, I believe me, I will take the word of a native over that of a, a New York writer. Well, plus he wrote some of the guidebooks, Charles. I hate to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so can you comment also in terms of Wentworth Homes? I think I live across. Well, I do live across the street from the <laughs> Mark Wentworth home. Yeah. Um, and my property was formerly owned by the Wentworths, yeah. but um, that is the home, I believe the home of Governor John Wentworth. Right. Yep. Okay, unpleasant. All right, but that's different than Benning Wentworth's home. Yes, Benning uh, was his uncle. Uh, Sir John, interestingly enough, um, became the governor of Nova Scotia. Uh, and he was, he did in Nova Scotia what he did in New Hampshire. Right. And he's very, very, his memory is very much revered up there. He was also made a baronet, which is a sort of hereditary knighthood. Um, I think his grandson was the last of them. But interestingly enough, there are still American descended baronets running around. The Johnsons are still with us. They were so big in the Mohawk Valley. Um, but no, Sir, Sir John carved out a whole other career for himself in Nova Scotia, which a lot of uh, a lot of loyalists did. If you're not familiar with it, I can recommend a book by Kenneth Roberts, who uh, gave us things like uh, Northwest Passage, Drums Along the Mohawk, 
He wrote a book from the uh, loyalist point of view called Oliver Wiswell, which I recommend very, very highly. Uh, another one that is not what you would call pro-loyalist, but it certainly deals sympathetically with them, is a uh, historical novel by James Boyd, the North Carolina writer, called Drums. Mm -hmm. And I recommend that very highly. Um, no, there is a question from Edward Kaler to everyone. Uh, you were to tell you would tell us a little more about Robert Lee Frost. Well, not that much to tell. I don't know how much his uh, his father's southern sympathies affected him, but certainly New Hampshire, and again Portsmouth on the one hand, and what had been the frontier during the Revolution, was where you found your New Hampshire copperheads, um, and a lot of them like the loyalists did not uh, were not really appreciated by their neighbors free speech and all that being very important to us all of course and so uh frost the elder had to hightail it to california kind of like my dad although not my dad was not a confederate sympathizer living <clears throat> in the 1860s um i'd be a lot older if he had been <laughs> uh, at any rate no but robert frost um I've always found it ironic, though, that Frost, who is such an icon of New Hampshire, <laughs> should have had been named after General Lee. I mean, it, it, it just, uh, it, it would be like, oh, I don't know. It would be like some, some famous Southern writer being named uh, Nathaniel, Nathaniel Hawthorne Lanier. You know, what? <laughs> really? Old Nate Lanier, we called him. <laughs> All right. Do we have any more? Our keeper has a question. It looks like. Okay. Yes. Can you can you hear me? I yes. can. Excellent. Uh, sorry, I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty. First, I want to thank you, Charles and Jake, for an excellent presentation. Uh, secondly, I want to note that you mentioned uh, William Johnson, uh, whose uncle was uh, Sir Peter Warren, who's gigantic portrait hangs in our reading room. Yep. And uh, secondly, I want to ask a, a meaningful question, which is given that New Hampshire in the revolution probably had a population of, I don't know, 12,000, something like that, only 75 loyalists were proscribed no. Only 15 were hauled in for questioning and only five were jailed and all five were ultimately released. No. Uh, do, do you think that uh, New Hampshire was in a way uh, much more amenable to loyalists than some of the other provinces? I, I think very much so because you see, how do I put this? New Hampshire, um, with loyalist sympathies would have meant at the end of the day, I mean, uh, and, and loyalists, I said 100,000 left, don't think by any stretch that that was the majority of the loyalists, because it wasn't. Right. So to give you an example from another colony, uh, the, um, the, um, uh, in New York, the doctor of the of the port, you know, the quarantine doctor of New York, uh, was very much a loyalist. But when the British left, he stayed on because they they offered him to keep they offered to keep him in his job because there had no one else to, to serve as quarantine doctor. Now there was a, another um, individual, I think, the surveyor of the port, who um, was in the same position. If they had gotten rid of him, the, they'd have had to shut the port of New York for quite a while. Well, why are these two people important to us? They were the father and the father-in-law of St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. And had it, had it not been for both her husband's family and her family being so important to the continuance of the port of New York, they'd have been banished. But you have another example, um, one of the most famous uh, loyalist 
uh, clergymen in New England, where most of them, like Reverend Charles Inglis in New York and all that, left, one stayed. And the reason why he stayed was because he was one of the very few willing to stay in the whole of Connecticut. And his name was Samuel Seabury. Mm -hmm. uh, you know him as the first presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. So usually if loyalists were A, willing to, and B, had skills that the, the new regime did not want to lose, they stayed and they were left alone. Uh, there was uh, in New Hampshire, I can't remember his name for the life of me, but in New Hampshire, the uh, Sir John's secretary, who was a convinced loyalist, his name was Atkinson, I think, yeah. Uh, he stayed, and they gave him a position under the new government after the war was over. Because, again, he was very good at what he did. So I, I suspect, especially given the frontier nature of New Hampshire, as it was then, uh, that you're probably, uh, you're probably quite correct that uh, New Hampshire was easier on them as a rule. Any particular information on the roles of newspapers? Oh, lots, lots. Uh, and not just New Hampshire. But the, uh, the newspapers were one of the biggest elements in the, in the uh, revolution. And one of the reasons, one of the things that the loyalists, of course, objected to was that all their papers got smashed. You know, and their their pamphlet publishers and all that were targeted, which is why, incidentally, we don't have too many loyal beyond 1775. We don't have too many loyalist pamphlets because the the rebels were very keen on getting them whenever and however they could. And they they were very effective. They did, you know, very often with revolutions. We saw this with the French, and the Russians and so on. The new regime will um, assign the equivalent of block wardens. You know, people to keep an eye on activities within small areas. You always find somebody willing to do that kind of job, uh, either out of um, out of the deepest, highest, uh, noblest intentions, or out of opportunism. But what? <laughs> oh, oh, like being wanting to spy on your neighbors isn't a sign of truth and patriotism. Ha! Gosh. I can see where you would have been in Cuba. Anyhow, man. <laughs> no, but seriously, uh, it was a very, um, it was, they were very effective at it. And the use of newspapers, the propaganda was very effective. No doubt about it. Now, there, uh, Luke, could uh, Luke lay on or can I see it? Let me see. Uh, oh, look, chats. I feel excited. A minute connection between the wars of the three kingdoms and the revolution. Is there an argument for the revolution being the last of the uh, British Civil Wars? Very good question, Luke. You get, you get kudos for that. Um, it works both ways, but yes. Um, there is a book I recommend very highly called The Cousins Wars. Now, it's not the only book to advance this notion by a long shot, but it's probably the easiest to get and the uh, most effective. It basically argues that the uh, American Revolution was the penultimate in the uh, in the series of wars that altered the Anglosphere from a little Catholic kingdom on the fringe of Europe to the great behemoth that straddles the earth, um, and the the idea being that the struggles and around the Scottish, English, and Irish Reformations. Uh, the Wars of the Three Kingdoms, the so-called Glorious Revolution, the Jacobite Wars, our revolution slash civil war, and our second civil war were all chapters in this same history. And I think, I think a very compelling case can be made for that. I really do. Uh, it's interesting. One of the things he goes into is showing where in Britain, where support for the Loyalists, support for the rebels was, and similarly, support for the South, support for the North. And one of the things that's very interesting is that by and large, the areas that had been Cavalier or Jacobite in England, Scotland, and Ireland tended to support 
the uh, effort against the rebels in America and tended to support the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. And then vice versa. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that's a, a very good question. I think it's a very powerful, uh, very, very powerful possibility. I should say, in the, um, again, in the interests of uh, full disclosure, that on my French-Canadian side, I've got a bit of Scots blood. And I made an important discovery last weekend. Hmm. Now, I had known that my multiple great-grandfather, Lachlan McKinnon, had come from the island of Egg. Uh, oh. People are a little scrambled. Aboard the, um, well, hence the name, but never mind. Anyway, uh, oh. he, uh, he came to Canada aboard the Brig Alexander in 1772, which for Scots Canadians is like the Mayflower. It was the first... Mm. big settlement ship, came to PEI. I won't bore you with the details, but what I will tell you is that I had known that his family had had members of Culloden, that his brothers had died there. Mm. But since, as I understood, he himself was born in 1738, obviously this wasn't directly connected to him. Uh, last weekend, I found through the miracle of the internet a notice of his death in 1830. He was born in 1723 and had been at the Battle of Culloden. Wow. And he died at the patriarchal age of 107. Whoa. Which, you know, God forbid those genes have come down to me. <laughs> 47 more years. No. Yeah. No. But. I mention this because rather than merely being uncles who died for King Charlie, uh, he fought for him. And I, I spoke to a Canadian historian uh, shortly after I found this out who's familiar with my family. And I said, and he had seen this himself. I said, well, why all these years, all the sources say 1738, not 1723? And this was his obituary. Why? And he said, well, I can't really tell you except to say that uh, he would have been prescribed. And he probably lied about his age, so there wouldn't be any difficulty in coming to Canada. So <laughs> that's, uh -huh. I don't know. Sense. All right. Uh, how and where does the fourth war involving Cataloa figure into the revolution? Good question. And the answer is uh, that remember that the French and the Spanish and the Dutch were not just fighting Britain in America but in the high seas, in Africa, in Europe, hence the siege of Gibraltar that uh, someone pointed out earlier, um, and in India. Hmm. Wherever, the, wherever they were anywhere near each other, they fought. And that's why. Oh, that was the Cheatham. That's you. All right. Good. Yes. Wasn't that a little late? Now, one one thing that got my attention was I lived and worked in India for three years, and I, on the other coast, okay, but I'd never heard of Cuddalor. And oh, it was my business to... to the battle yeah. of the town. I, even even the, the town, which I gather is 175,000 plus or something right now. A little, little big for a town, but Chennai, yes, and, India is uh, India's a big place. And the funny thing is, yeah. the, the end result was that the French had taken Cuddalore, finally. And uh, they had to give it back because, you know, it was like the Battle of New Orleans. Right. So they, mm -hmm. uh, but, I mean, that's what happens when you don't have the internet. That's why they were very silly to do anything without the internet back then. Someone should have told them. <laughs> But it's, it's, uh, it is amazing. I mean, the Napoleonic Wars were fought down there, Mysore, Tipu Sahib, uh, all the... Uh, we tend to forget, and this is something I've always tried to bring out in my own history, is not to pat myself on the head, but we tend to forget that everything is connected, in a sense, to everything else. And the, 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 even the story of, of Mysore and Tipu Sahib is intimately bound up with the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. And, uh, I mean, similarly, the first French connection with Indochina really wasn't a Napoleon III, it was Louis XVI. Hmm. 
Hmm. who was given the island of Khan San by the emperor of Vietnam in return for trading concessions. Hmm. So the emperor of Anaheim, I should say. So yeah, at that same period, 1783, the French gave the island of St. Um, oh, my heavens, St. Bartholomew, St. Bart's to Sweden. Mm-hmm. Because Gustavus III was a great friend of Louis XVI. And in return for trading privileges in Gothenburg, Sweden, they got this little island in the Caribbean, which stayed Swedish for 100 years when they gave it back to, to France. But to this day, the capital of St. Bart's is Gustavia, after Gustav III. The devil is in the details. The history is in everything else. Richard. Yes. Oh, I know. Um, Tom's point about perhaps a differentiation between how loyalists were treated in New Hampshire, um, with all those small numbers of people whose properties were taken, etc. cetera. Um, Tom's book points out um, after the revolution, Jonathan Fisher comes back yeah. and the legislature just gives the property back. Yep. Well, and that makes perfect sense because what would have happened to it otherwise? I, I don't know how to put this to you nicely, but unlike other states, there were not a ton of people lining up to come to New Hampshire. You noticed. I, you know, the cotton wasn't very good. Tobacco crops were poor. Uh, the sugar cane, you know, that uh, was famous in Keene didn't <laughs> last long. So, but you, you never heard of the indigo plantations on, uh, right. in uh, uh, Winchester, New Hampshire? <laughs> well, neither is anyone else, so it's fine. But no, I, I mean, New Hampshire was very much frontier territory. And that dominated, that was the biggest single dominating factor in the early history of New Hampshire. It wasn't even- What do you mean early history? It still is. Well, I don't want to say anything unkind. <laughs> no, New Hampshire, it's, it's a fascinating place. I, uh, you know, not, not that this means anything or it's, or it's useful, but uh, two years before I was born in 1960, I mentioned we would always take this house in Hampton Beach. My brother got stung on the eye by a hornet. Now, my brother's seven years older than me, so he would have been, what, he was born in 53, so he was five years old. Never forgot it. Well, I had not been to Hampton Beach, well, since I was a boy, until about four or five years ago. I was with a friend. You know who I mean, Jake Sullivan. So, Jake Owell knows him. Anyway, it's two Jakes. There's a movie in there somewhere. Anyway, so there, there we are, and I'm telling... Jake Sullivan, the inevitable story of the hornet that stung my brother there at Hampton Beach. No sooner are the words out of my mouth than this huge hornet flies right by me. <laughs> and Jake looks at me and says, you're probably the great, 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 great granddaughter, you know, attracted by the story. So I, I posted this on Facebook that I'd been to Hampton Beach. I didn't mention the hornet. My brother posts, Hampton Beach is where I got stuck by a hornet in 1950." So that's another familial connection, the Hornet at Hampton Beach that we've never been able to outlive. Remember that if you ever go there and see a Hornet. Quite likely. So, uh, any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Charles, Terry Packer here. Yes. Um, um, there we go. I wondered if you could speak to the practical aspects related to an association test, if I have that right. In uh, records exist in New Hampshire of people physically apparently having to sign a document of association with either the revolution or uh, or royal government. Uh, I was wondering whether that was a widespread practice throughout all of the colonies, and um, you know what political entity was organized enough to administer that on a widespread uh, scale across a colony. Did it, have a a very good... did it have a practical outcome of intimidation of royalists or whoever was intended to respond? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there, there were several things at play all at once. Firstly, 
remember that the loyalists were the the uh, party of the of what was the party of the moment. I mean, again, I, I, I think it's fair to say that all of us here are uh, fairly loyal, more or less, to the government we live under. It's the only government we know. Um, if events started moving toward that government's overthrow, uh, how many of us would be jumping up and down to do something about it? Uh, not that many. Forty percent. Well, maybe. But the the point I'm making is that inevitably, and not just in America, but again, looking at revolutions of all sorts around the globe, a defending normality, or what you see as normality, is not an immediate driving cause. It may be a sentiment, but it's not something you're immediately going to jump up and down about. And that leaves the initiative in organizing anything to the other side. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, uh, you've also got to bear in mind, not so much in New Hampshire, but in the rest of the colonies, the people that supported the revolution tended to be the people who were already pretty much the dominant force in each colony. They dominated the assemblies, county governments, and so forth. So that was why they had the, they had the initiative. Um, now, there were, however, loyal associations in uh, most of the colonies. In New York and a few other places, there were literally, when the Declaration of Independence was signed, you had uh, groups of people sign declarations of dependence uh, <laughs> to declare their loyalty to the king. Um, but it, it certainly had a very intimidating effect. And it's also important to bear in mind that they had kind of had experience with this during the, uh, the Stamp Act, the agitation against the Stamp Act and the agitation against the, uh, the Townsend Acts. Uh, the tax on tea and so forth, which, you know, I, I, I have to say that the, the tea thing has always struck my funny bone in a way because uh, it was really on the, on the British government's part a brilliant move, to be honest with you. I mean, looking at it in the abstract, you got to bear several things in mind. The Seven Years' War ends. <laughs> During the course of the Seven Years' War, the uh, British, because the colonial militias, I don't mind telling you, weren't much use against the French. <laughs> uh, just thought I'd mention that, you know. But uh, as a result, the British had to send over a new, ar a new army every year. And they had to use the Royal Navy extensively. Well, all that cost, you know, it wasn't free. Uh, they ended the war with a huge debt. Now, what do you do with that? To service the debt, of course, they had to raise taxes on the British taxpayer. Not a single ministry after the war was keen on getting out of the colonies anything like their share of the fight. What they were after getting was a symbolic amount to reassure the British taxpayer, Reed Voter, that the colonies were doing their part and not just getting a free ride. Also bear something else in mind, that most white adult males could not vote for most of the colonial assemblies. And they were the ones that levied most of the taxes that everybody paid. Important thing to bear in mind. So when you hear no taxation without representation, let that start at home and then we'll talk. Mm -hmm. Having said that, uh, ministry after ministry tried and failed to come up with a way to do what I've said, to get the colonies to pay a symbolic amount. They never succeeded. But the tea tax was a fascinating idea. I'll tell you why. The East India Company was on the verge of bankruptcy. Right. Now, if the East India Company went bankrupt, now, remember the huge debt I talked about? Imagine the fun of taking on the expense of governing India. Mm -hmm. Thanks, but no thanks. So how do they keep the East India Company going and do something about America at the same time? Hmm. Smart idea. We'll sell untaxed East India tea in the colonies. 
it'll be cheaper than the smuggled tea that have made, made men like John Hancock wealthy. And what's not to like? The colonials, those who drink tea anyway, will get cheaper tea. The East India Company will be saved. We'll put a, a, a sort of uh, symbolic tax on East India tea, which will be minuscule. And so it'll look as though the colony in Britain, it'll look as though the colonies are paying their share, but they'll be getting cheap East India tea, which will both save the East India Company and put the smugglers like Hancock out of business. What's not to like? <laughs> Apparently a lot. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's just say certain people didn't appreciate the idea. And uh, I'll just say my last point on that point is that some years ago, I, I, there is a specific amount, which I cannot for the life of me remember, but the specific amount that would have been saved the average tea drinker by, had the East India tea been unloaded. I, I, I can't remember what it was, but it so happened that I took a bunch of Catholic seminarians on a history tour of the Boston area. And during my lecture, I had mentioned this point. And one of the seminarians said in the prissiest, most annoying voice imaginable, he said, well, exactly how much would have been saved? <laughs> I don't know. And his response was like, hmm. You know, I thought not, meaning you made it up, you liar. <laughs> so uh, the next day, we after, the, after that, we go to Lexington and we sit through the film they have. Now, this was not the film you'll see now. It was the film that came in the 1776 Bicentennial, and they were still showing it 20 years later. So this one fellow is representing the rebel outside, and he says, you know, we're going to, we don't want that tea. And then he says, so we would save exactly what the amount was <laughs> we want freedom <laughs> and <laughs> when we got out of that theater i pulled that kid aside and i said look <laughs> if you ever have the temerity to pull that garbage on me again i will break your neck and feed it to you <laughs> which i know what you're saying probably not the best way to Refer to future holy priests, <laughs> but I felt fine. pretty, pretty <laughs> provoked. But at any rate, it was funny to have it come from that source, and it was exactly the amount which I still can't remember. <laughs> All right, uh, John's iPad Pro flashed at me. Oh, sorry. No, no, don't be sorry. All right, any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Going once. Going twice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Get some John. sleep. Sorry? It's late. It is. It's 10, 19 10 p.m. Now. <laughs> 10, 19 p.m. But let me just say that if ever I get the chance to get back to Portsmouth and anti-COVID permits, <laughs> I'll be very happy if you'll have me to visit the Athenaeum. Please so, do. Oh, so indeed. Definitely. I'll, I'll thank sign you, the thank book. You. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks. God bless you, everybody. Good night Bye. from Austria.